Hello, everyone. I'm happy to see you all joining this webinar. Today, we are going to talk about the growth and about the localization and how you can use the localization as a growth lever. So without further ado, let's start. Mani sauts Aleksandrs, un es esmu vadītājs, vadušais produktu vadītājs, un šodien es pastatīšu jums par lokalizācijas kā izaugsmes rīku. I will stop now. I guess I lost more than 90% of you at this point, uh, because I was speaking in Latvian, which is my native language. And that shows you how important it is to localize your product, localize your experiences, because otherwise you can be missing out on a, a big chunk of your, of your audience. So now let me introduce myself in English language. So my name is Alex. I am a lead product manager at Localize, which is a localization platform. And today I'm going to talk uh, to you about the localization as a growth lever. And there are a couple of takeaways that you, I want to focus on, and I want to make sure that you get out of this webinar. First, what growth means for your product and how to actually achieve it. Second, why international expansion and product localization should be part of your growth strategy. Third, what effective localization process looks like and how to avoid some common mistakes, how to actually get started with it. And last but not least, how localization accelerates growth in at three industry-leading tech companies. So let's speak about growth now. What's growth? Growth is consists of three main inputs. And by the way, this is not something that I invented. It's uh, um, I'm using this framework from, from Reforge, which I highly suggest everyone to take a look at. They are doing an amazing job at uh, spreading out the word about, about the product management and about the, the growth in particular. So your core growth engine is built on these three pillars, acquisition, retention, and monetization. And previously, you could have been looking at the growth in terms of the funnel. So all we know this AARRR. Uh, funnel, but we encourage to take a look at the growth from the compounding loop perspective, because eventually your growth engine, which as I've said, consists of acquisition, retention, and monetization, is a combination of a number of compounding loops that com they, they compound and they produce more growth as a result. So looking at the acquisition what is the acquisition acquisition is basically it arrives from the marketing channels but not only your product also can be a source for the acquisition um, and it tells new people about your product that it exists and that it can solve their pain and that's how you attract more uh, people to to use your product retention is responsible for making sure that your users return, return to use your product, they are engaged with it, they keep on using it. And it's also, um, it's also an output in itself. It actually consists of three inputs, which is activation, how users are activating within your product, when they are reaching this aha moment, when do they understand that it allows to solve a specific problem. Engagement, how, they, how you can make sure that they keep using your product, they keep getting back to your product after they eventually got the value. And resurrection, it's about um, whenever you, for whatever reason, you might have some, some dormant users who stopped using your product, how you can make sure that you can pull them back, how you can win them back to uh, make sure that they can continue using your product. And last but not least is monetization. It's about converting your active user base into the paying customers or finding some new ways to attract more revenue from existing audience. So think about upsells to higher plans or think about the cross-sells to other complementary products that you potentially uh, can have and so on and so forth. So let's remember this uh, core growth loop and this three main uh, inputs that, that the, the loop is based on. Now let's take a look at the McKinsey seven degrees of freedom of growth. And that's basically a framework that I won't go into too much details, but I highly recommend everyone reading a bit more about it. So once you kind of once you know what is the core growth engine of your product, you need to think about the different tactics and strategies that you can deploy in order to uh, make sure that you can get this growth. And today I'm going to talk about the seven principles, not from the theoretical perspective, but more to kind of show you how they can be applied to a real life context. And I will, will be using Notion as an example. No, I hope everyone is familiar with what Notion is. 
It's a popular note taking and project management tool. Um, and let's take a look at Notion through the lens of these seven uh, points that you see on the screen. So first one is selling existing products to existing customers. So for example, we know that there is a lot of users who use the personal plan of Notion to manage some day-to-day -day things from their personal lives. So let's target those who have registered with the company email address and they are using the personal plan and let's try to upgrade them to the team plan in order so that they can use it in the business context in order uh, in order to make sure that they can use it in uh, in their workplace. So that's number one. Number two, acquiring new customers in existing markets. We can target the same cohort by offering them a personal prop plan if they encourage use within their organization by inviting five users to try the team plan, for example. So that's kind of another tactic that you can uh, you can deploy in order to acquire new customers, but like in the in the existing uh, in the existing markets. Third, creating new products and services. So in this case, for example, let's say that Airtable, which to some sort of extent competes with Notion is increasing in popularity. And we could develop a table-based view to decrease users' loss to, to uh, Airtable. So that's, that could be something that we can, we can do. Developing new value delivery approaches. Let's explore new sales channels that we can use. Let's explore the partnership program. Let's explore the consultants that we can work with who can help sell Notion as a product. Five, moving into new geography, something that we will focus on heavily today. So expansion, Notion's expansion to Japan was very successful. And now using the same model, you can run the growth experiment to go into the South Korea because you know that there is a, a large number of customers that are based there. So that's something that you can use in order to, to generate more growth. Um, sixth point is creating a new industry uh, structure. So think about partnering with Slack and packaging two tools for a reduced price. This could be mutually beneficially for both for Slack and for Notion. And that's the way you create a new industry structure. And last but not least is opening up a new competitive arenas. For example, targeting universities by offering a reduced price to academics and students. And this could encourage the stickiness among the next generation of tech employees because the, the Notion will be already embedded into their life eventually. So these are seven examples, but again, for the sake of today's conversation, we will be focusing purely on one, and this is moving into new geographies and how localization can, can help with that. But before I dive into that, I wanted to show you this chart. This is the growth in monthly active users of Facebook, and uh, where you see this big spike, guess what, what, what's happened there, right? They started localizing their platform and that resulted in a massive growth in terms of their uh, active user base. If we look at some other companies, big digital companies like DigitalOcean, HubSpot, Salesforce, and Slack, the numbers that you see on the screen represent the, the share of, of growth that is coming from outside of their home market. So this is huge for all of them. And uh, I was looking at one, re one report where CEOs have been um, asked about the international expansion, whether it was part of their strategic growth planning or not, or not, 44% of them highlighted that new customer acquisition is the main reason for um, for expanding into uh, into new geographies, and 41% of them said that it was key part of their strategic growth planning. So it's not a question of if; it's a question of when you should start um, localizing. And if we go back to our <coughs> to our growth engine and to our three loops, we can think about how localization can help with with all three acquisition, retention, and monetization. And in this slide, as you can see, I've kind of put this into three three buckets. First one is awareness and consideration when your visitors are still they they don't know yet kind of what your product has to offer. They uh, consider buying it maybe. And how you can, for example, localize your marketing content, think ads, website, landing pages, content, blog, emails, to speak their language and to generate more interest. You can also, you can also provide some content to your, to your international sales force, 
who can use this localized content in order to better convert the leads. Second, purchase and adoption. Here we are speaking about the user experience. So your apps, mobile apps, web apps, whatever the product kind of you have, it's your website. It's, for example, the, the you might be in the game world where your um, where the game is consumed by by the audience from the different parts of the world. So if you localize the user experience, <coughs> then you are able to um, successfully affect the following metrics, such as CSAT scores, NPS, customer loyalty. You can increase the activation and retention. You can also generate some upsell opportunities from within the product. And last, which is engagement, it's so consider basically your product was purchased, the, the, the person engages with your product, but I personally, as, a, as a, someone who uses a lot of B2B SaaS tools, whenever I use the product, whenever I have the problem, problem I reach out to their support, I read their documentation in order to figure out how I can solve this, this problem. And here, think about the customer service localization, so how you can localize your knowledge bases, how you can localize the, the conversations happening in live chat and or, or ticket systems, whatever you use, so that your post-sales cycle is also being taken care of, of from the perspective of localization. And again, that can significantly impact the customer loyalty, the CSAT scores, and, and the retention overall. And now, kind of once you know all of this, kind of the, the pretty, I think, fundamental question for a lot of you would be how do I get started because I would assume that some of you haven't really thought about how you can localize your product even those who did maybe you know there were a couple of attempts but they were not very successful and before going into the details I wanted to say that localization falls into the kind of the the the, the, the strategic planning horizon of like one to three years plans in order to make sure that your localization program is successful. But obviously before that, there are some steps that you need to take in order to make sure that it will have a positive return on, on investment in the given uh, period of time. So what are the, the steps that you can take in order to start uh, with the localization program? First <coughs> is obviously a research. You need to study and pick your, your, your markets that you want to go after. And you can start off with speaking to your sales force. You can start by talking to your support colleagues to understand where does the demand coming from. For instance, there might be a lot of prospects coming from specific geographies. There might be a lot of conversations that your support team is having where users are reaching out in, in non-English language and um, support is not able to support them at this point. You can also look into the existing analytics tool, tools, look at your uh, Google Analytics, at Mixpanel, Amplitude, Heap, and so on and so forth to understand what are the, the, the regions and the, the countries that most of your users are coming from. And that could be to serve as a kind of first point from which you can assess different markets and try to prioritize what are perhaps the the, 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 the languages that you want to localize your product to first. Then divide those into a couple of tiers uh, based on the poten business potential and, and, and the needs coming from, from this market in order to, um, to make a decision. And another tip that I can give here is do not be afraid to experiment with, for example, if you know that there is a lot of demand coming from Italian uh, market, for instance, do not be afraid to localize a couple of ads and the landing page to Italian language in order to generate um, some demand from that and in order to validate your hypothesis that it will uh, result into higher conversion rates um, and so on and so forth. Because it's way easier to do than to, you know, um, than to localize your entire journey. Once you're <coughs> sure about the markets that you want to go after, define your content scope. Because once you picked your markets and languages that you want to go after, then it's super important to provide this end-to-end -end localization journey because that will result in a way more positive user experience and you, your program will be more successful, if I can say so. And by defining the content scope, I think about, again, you have your product, you have your websites, you might have some landing pages that are used in paid campaigns. You can have the, the product documentation that I talked about a bit earlier. 
emails, notifications, some legal documents, and some content for your sales force to be working with, and a lot of other things that needs to be carefully analyzed in order to understand what is the what what we have at our hands that we need to actually be uh, be localizing in order to go after a new new market. Then form a core team and a workflow. And here I cannot stress enough on this point. It's super important to involve a lot of different stakeholders who will have um, who will affect your your localization program. Basically, think about developers because if your product is not yet internationalized then this is something that we need to do. And we need to really set the timeline when this can be done. And without them, it's I've seen so many times the, the localization program just really didn't take off because you know this hasn't been carefully thought of. Linguists, your translators, your reviewers, how you'll be doing that. And I will talk in a second about the uh, about the translation agencies and so on. Based on your business model, you can have some country managers who are overseeing a specific country. They need to be heavily involved in the whole process. Marketing people so that they can adjust their go-to-market strategies uh, so that they can, again, um, be involved in the process of localizing their content, like websites, landing pages, uh, blogs, and so on and so forth. Sales executives. So what are this? Do you need to hire a specific sales executives from specific regions? How you change your... Your structure of your, your your team and department right now, so that you have sales executives working with specific um, regions and countries. Legal advisors. So, do you need to open a new legal entity in another country, for example? Do you need to think to know about being tax compliant in specific countries, for instance? And again, there is some nuances that you need to be aware of. So, involving your legal people or outsourcing the legal people from the specific markets would be highly desirable. Now, once you kind of have your team form, you understand the scope, it's time to estimate the costs and the timeline to understand how much you would spend on the localization program. And here, you can start off by asking for some, 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 some rates of, of translations from different translation agencies and language service providers. And you can ask the rates for the specific language pairs, and then you can use kind of, it's very generic, but you can use a number of 2,500 words per translator per day. And you can multiply by the number of words you have in your content in the scope that you've analyzed. And you can roughly understand how much it will cost you to, to localize all the content that you want to the languages that you want to go after. Then you can also think about the uh, additional language services and you can speak with your, uh, with potential candidates for the, uh, for being your LSP in order to understand what are the overheads like LQA, linguistic quality insurance. If you're working in a heavily regulated industry, that will be super important because you, your, your translation quality should be top-notch. Otherwise, you can have some legal and financial consequences. So think about that. Think about the project management overheads. If you're planning to go after like 10 new, 20 new languages, then there will be project managers managing the translators from these languages. So <coughs> do not forget about that. Technology subscription fees. You will need a technology to be a single source of truth of your localized content. I will talk about it in a second. So you need to account for this cost. Team expansion, again, whether you need to hire someone, for example, localization manager or a head of localization who will be overseeing the whole program. And yeah, maybe there are a couple of more things involved, but this is the core of the, of the estimating the, the costs in this situation. Finding the right technology. You should have a platform that, that is a single source of truth for your localized content. And you need to make sure that it integrates well with your tech stack, because if it doesn't, then that's a huge problem. I've seen a number of times when companies were relying on the semi-manual processes, and that slowed down their release cycles. And their development team, their product teams were really frustrated because they were not able to ship new features, new products at the same pace as they used to and because of the localization, because it was just an afterthought. It was not happening in the parallel and um, it resulted in huge delays and it eventually it became a burden. So think about that. Think about the automation and pre-translation capabilities. So for example, there are, there are a lot of tasks involved in localization that you can just automate. And um, also you can pre-translate your content using the machine translation engines in order to save some time and maybe some cost so that your linguists work with the already pre-translated content. Vendor agnostic, this one is super important. I cannot stress enough on this. Basically, once in the past, you were 
companies were going to translation agencies and language service providers um, and partnering with them and they use their own technology which meant that they have been in charge of your content and in this case you want to find a technology where you are controlling your content and partners help working and translating that and then in case you are going after new languages new markets you can go after the, the vendors who have who are very have a high expertise in these markets, in these languages, but also you can negotiate with the different vendors. You are not locked in with their solution and then they can you know, increase the cost significantly. Easy to use UI, localization would be probably something new for your employees. And uh, you want to make sure that you know, the learning curve of, you, of learning the, 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 the product is quite uh, low. Flexibility and scalability. <coughs> Again, like I've seen a number of times when companies built out something in-house and then they had to maintain it as they grow and the amount of content was growing, amount of languages was growing and their system was not able to cope with that. And it required, you know, adding more resources, adding more people, spending more money in order to just maintain it. And it's not scalable. So unless you're Amazon, Facebook, Google, who do have their own proprietary technologies here, I would strongly advise not to go into the in-house solution mode and rather look for a scalable solution that would um, help you in the long term. Meaning the security requirements, I think this goes without saying, especially if you have a highly sensitive content. Last but not least here is finding a appropriate partner. So make sure you find someone who is has enough expertise in your selected regions and languages, something that I mentioned briefly before. Make sure you get some references from the similar customers. Don't be afraid to do that, especially from your niche. For example, if you're working in a fintech, there's a lot of you know, terminology that is very specific to this industry. So try to find a vendor who has some customers from this, this niche already it will be easier for them to translate. They will understand the terminology way better. Experience working with modern technologies, uh, super important because again, as I've said, some providers in the past, they had their own technology. They've been using some desktop based solutions. And so they are not really used to be working with the modern tools and technologies. And that's a no-go, that's a red flag because they won't be able to, you know, to support some, to work with the technology that would support some points that I made in number five. And then last but not least, just don't be afraid to order the test translations to measure the quality. Run this past some of your friends, some of your colleagues to really assess whether, you know, this is the quality that you are expecting to get from them. Now I will talk on the high level about like, how does the, this process looks like? I mentioned a couple of times, uh, single source of truth. So this is the, the system that you see in the middle. This is your localization software. I just localize in this situation. I'm biased, I work here, but there are a number of other products who, um, who solve the same problem. And as you can see, it connects with your translation service providers who can work inside the product, but also outside in their own tools, but it will be integrated with the single source of truth localization platform. Your design and UX teams, super important, who work with their Figma, Sketch, Adobe XD and so on. And so they will be able to push strings, but also the, the screenshots to the system to provide the context for the linguist to be able to more efficiently translate your content. Development teams who work with the code, who write the code and uh, who push it to the code repositories. And again, the single source of truth will be able to speak with the code repositories, or you can also build uh, your own integrations using the API but you want to make sure that whenever the new files are pushed and they're being picked up by the localization platform and you see new content from your product appearing uh, or the modified content and your translation teams can easily pick this content up. And then there should be ways to deploy this localized content to different platforms. I actually will show more platforms on the next slide, but like to, to, to your mobile app, over the years so that you can bypass, for example, the, the having to, to deploy a new version of the, of the app to the, uh, to the app store, but also like your website and, and the web app. And speaking of the technology, as I kind of mentioned, there, this is the product, uh, product that sits in the middle, a single source of truth. And on the left-hand side, we see all the localization translation tools, for example, cat tools, translation memory, some quality assurance, uh, spelling and grammar, um, softwares which do connect with a single source of truth and again they make the life of the translators much easier either they work inside the tool like localist or they work outside and this content is synchronized 
content storage backends, again, source code repositories, CMS systems, if you're working with a headless CMS or other CMS system so that you can push and pull the content between the systems, e-commerce, knowledge bases, help desks, and marketing automation for like emails and campaigns and stuff like that. And last but not least is translation service providers. So you can work with traditional SPs like RWS or Clara who work with their own products often and they integrate with a single source of truth. <clears throat> or you can, for example, in case of Localize, we have a mini marketplace to be able to order some translations from crowdsourced places like Gengo. And we do also integrate with the machine translation so that you can pre-translate the content. And then once you start working um, with the localization, you go through different levels of localization maturity mo model. In the level one, you start with experimenting, right? So you're releasing ad hoc, you're still trying to understand, you know, kind of, it does, does it have like the positive uh, return on investment or not? That's kind of where you start internationally utilizing your product, starting doing some ad hoc uh, localization efforts. In the level two, you already start defining your process and you start to work with vendors. You start to lay out kind of the whole workflow and the process. You start to automate some routine tasks and you set some expectations among key stakeholders that I mentioned before. Level three is when you start measuring, so establishing some KPIs to make sure that your localization program really performs and provides the positive ROI. You become more data-driven. Level four is when you start optimizing your, 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 your process and um, you're continuously, you're already at this point, continuously deploying your localized products or features and you're improving the, uh, the process based on the data that you're, you're, you're getting, which kind of you hopefully nailed during the level three. And level five, five world-class, you have nailed everything and this really becomes your standard business process and it's very predictable, you know how to work with it whenever you go after new languages. It's very, by the way, it's kind of, it's abstract, but I hope it provides some, uh, some hub for you to understand where you're at and what you should be aiming for next. And last but not least, I wanted to showcase a couple of examples of um, tech companies for whom localization accelerated their growth. First one is Withings. So they raised 60 million to relaunch its growth in 2018 and localization was key element of their growth strategy. Right now, HealthMade app is available in 190 countries and 11 languages. Initially, when they've been doing localization, they really struggled kind of with the, the, the release cycles. Localization was a burden and was a bottleneck. It slowed down everything and not people were not happy. Developers, product managers were not happy with, with this process. And they accelerated the delivery of new features by 90% using Localize. But basically they kind of um, refined their workflow and they started to use this single source of truth. They connected their design teams, development teams who understood the importance of the single source of truth and um, agreed on the common workflow and that accelerated the delivery by 90%. Revolut. I actually personally interviewed the person who from Revolut who said localization was a shortcut to their growth. And what that what it meant is they used localization as opportunity to predictably grow and they, they, they were assessing different opportunities to grow quickly and localization was identified as, as one key element that they can you know, um, bring into their growth toolkit and that worked successfully for them. So they started localizing their product in 2017. At that point, their user base was 0 0.6 million, so 600,000. And right now, five, five years forward, it's more than 20 million users. They are present in 200 countries and regions. And their translation turnaround time is 48 hours. So from the moment that you have your new strings, so developer pushes some, some new code, their new um, keys that you need to translate, the translation process happens, the revision process happens, and then you deploy it, it all takes 48 hours. That's really world-class levels. And finally, Doximi, who went from one to 100 languages in just a few months. They were initially founded in 2014 in the US. And now they have more than 1 million users in 156 countries. The number of the users that are outside of the US is more than 25%, and the share is growing rapidly. And thanks to, the, again, this in this case, localized, but like a single source of truth platform, they have been able to save hundreds of hours of work, bring everyone together and really move from one to 100 languages in just a few months. That's a remarkable result. I haven't seen it 
uh, a lot. So that's how quickly, if kind of you do all the things right, that's how quickly you can scale to, to multiple languages. And I think that's for today, that's it. I hope it was useful. Thank you very much, everyone. Feel free to connect with me via email, alex at localize.com or via LinkedIn. I have my link posted here. So yeah, thanks a lot and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.